your salvation alone. But we are responsible for each other, but not for each other. The law of power, we have power over some things. We don't have power over others, including changing people, amen? And I've been learning that when we come into a marriage, and this is from my experience, everybody has different experience, everybody's at a different level, everybody's been married, been married before or still married, amen? But we come into a relationship and, and first it's all sun and flowers, sun and flowers, you know, you give her the sun, the flowers grow. But then there's things when you start to get to know each other, amen? Certain things you wanna change about them. Man, well, I don't like the way they do this. And it goes all the way down to our kids. We want to raise our kids to way, the way we want them to be raised, the way we, I want them to behave. Because sometimes I think they should behave a certain way when I'm in, at a certain place. The law of motivation, amen? That's what we're going to hang on to right now. Law number five, the law of motivation. Is that five or four? Uh, that's going to be number five. Uh, number four was number four was the law of respect. The law of respect. Amen. Who did that one? Brother yeah, Jerry. Jerry. Yeah, Brother Jerry. The law of motivation. I'm going to read something here that the uh, reader wrote. It says, Larry loves sports, all kinds, <laughs> right? We know people that love sports. They're crazy for sports. His wife, Jen, loved Larry but hates sports. Jen loved Larry, Larry loved sports, Jen hates sports. One of their biggest conflicts was when he would press her to go to professional hockey games with him. Come on, it will be fun, Larry would plead. And we'll be together, right? That's the second thing, we'll be together, come on, we'll have fun, and then he says, we'll be together. Though she didn't like hockey at all, Jen would think herself, God wants me to be loving, right? And I don't want Larry mad at me. Then grudgingly, check this out, then grudgingly, she would accompany, accompany him to the game. But without being aware of it, Jen would make sure Larry felt his displeasure. <laughs> his displeasure, she would do the following. Amen? Instead of setting boundaries, we've been talking about boundaries. Instead of telling, hey, I don't want to go, hey. So this is all about boundaries, amen? And we're going to get through this chapter, but this whole book is about boundaries. So she would do the following. Duando at home so that they would leave late. They would want to be late. Larry's probably like, come on, hurry. I'm going to leave you. If you don't hurry up, I'm out the door. He's already in the car already with the keys. I'm out. He says, show no interest in the game. She would be in a bad mood the whole time she's at the game. You know, everything would bother her. The guy's too loud to speak here. The game, I don't even like hockey. I don't understand hockey. Withdraw from Larry emotionally. That's a big one. When you do something, your spouse loves to do and you don't and, and you don't enjoy it at all guess what we draw emotionally we, we we withdraw from them she reminds him for days about how miserable the, the the time she had and she reminds him and she does this grudgingly so finally uh larry grew tired of taking his unenthusiastic un wife to the hockey games i'd rather not not go there and go at really and really be there he said, then Jen felt hurt that Larry hadn't appreciated her sacrifice. <laughs> she felt hurt, well I sacrificed myself for you. Isn't that enough? No, no. Larry hadn't appreciated her sacrifice for him. She didn't understand that her motives for saying yes to Larry's desires were healthy and that because of this, neither spouse was getting what or what or she needed, amen? They were going against the grain. Let me tell you, the law of motivation states that we must be free to say no before we can wholeheartedly say yes. And it's hard in a relationship to say no. We have to learn how to say no before we wholeheartedly say yes to something our spouse likes, amen? And I'm a yes person, I say yes to everything, amen? Pastor knows I'm, I, I've been breaking this cycle off of me to say no, I have to learn how to say no. And not in just in my marriage, but you might have another relationship where you can't say no. What about your, uh, your boss? You can't say no to your boss. You can't say no to this, you can't say no to your kids. It's okay to say no. The law of motivation, remember this, states that we must be free to say no before we can wholeheartedly say yes. 
Because when you can say no and when you wholeheartedly say yes, you enjoy what you're doing with your spouse. You enjoy doing what you're doing with your coworkers, amen, with your friends, with your family members, amen, that there's family members that do want to be saved. There's family members that are looking up to you, amen. No one can actually love another if he feels he doesn't have a choice not to. Remember that. No one can actually love another if he feels he doesn't have a choice not to. Giving your time, love, vulnerability to your spouse requires that you make your own choice based on your values, not your fear. Remember that based on your values and not your fear. Fear of what? Fear of losing your love. Fear of, of your spouse angry because you, didn't, you said no. Fear of being alone. Fear of being a bad person. You feel guilty because you hurt their feelings. Fear of one's guilty feelings. Fear of not reciprocating the love someone has given you. Thus hurting his or her feelings. Amen. Fear of losing the approval of others. Fear of hurting one's spouse because of over defying what his or her pain is. And we're going to go over pain. Pain is healthy in a relationship. Okay. And this book breaks it down. Have you ever felt some pain? Maybe some pain has come into your life, amen? And we think it was caused by people or it was caused by the enemy, amen? But the Lord, remember, God won't change the circumstances sometimes until he changes our hearts. That hit me hard, okay, with the, me and my wife and what my wife's going through. She's changing my heart. I have to be understanding. I, ha I, I can't just be a man and try to fix everything all the time and have a solution. Amen. Today, I was humbled today. God said, you can't always find a solution for everything. As a man, I work different. I want to find a solution for whatever, whatever problem there is. I want to find a solution. And God said, there's no solution right now. Your solution is to, to listen to your wife and to be there and listen to her and be there. Don't tell her what she needs. Don't tell her what you need. She just needs you there. She just needs chips and limon, Pastor. <laughs> chips and lemon, hot Cheetos and lemon. Amen. Oh, and candy. <laughs> but it's fear, amen. Maybe I have a fear, and the Lord's showing me this. I have a fear, and I still got to figure out what it is. What's my fear of not knowing what to do? The Lord's showing me. Maybe I have a fear of not, want, not knowing what to do, that finally I don't have an answer. Finally, I can't help her. And that's a fear that I have, and that's a fear that I have to say no to myself. No, you don't have the solution. No, it's not you that's going to fix the problem. No, it's not up to you. Amen. So the Lord's telling me, no, the law of motivation, no. I have to tell myself, no, even in marriage. Fear always works against love. To have to, have to destroys the choose to. Amen. How many times do we have to do? We have to. We have to for our family. We have to. We have to. We have to for God. We have to for our boss. We have to do this. We have to do that. And our have to has to change to we choose to. I get to. I'm able to. I'm privileged to. Amen. Instead of we have to. Amen. We know that uh, 1 John 4, 18, amen, perfect love casts all fear. Amen. And the Lord is showing me perfect love through my wife and what we're going through right now on how to love her without, without having a solution. I think that's my biggest fear right now and God's showing me right now is not having a solution for something. And God's like, it's okay. Maybe he's telling me, no, you don't have the solution. And I love this because this is not only about marriage. It's about relationships we have with others. It's about relationships, it's about ourselves. So God is moving, like Pastor said, God is moving, God moves through this. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. And we're made perfect in love every day. Every day, because I believe every day we experience some kind of fear, some kind of something that we can accomplish. As a man, I think we don't know this, but we have a fear of not accomplishing something that we had to do today. Say we have a task, and we, and we don't realize it, but God is showing me that sometimes I, need to, I think I need to finish it because I have a fear of not finishing it, and I have a fear of me feeling less of a man than I am. And I believe that's my ego. My ego goes down a little bit because I couldn't finish what I said I was going to finish. 
If you struggle with any of these fears, work on maturing through them, amen? We can all work through them. That's why this book is set on boundaries, so that they do not control you and rob you of your boundaries. Remember, we have boundaries, and we could say no to our spouse when you don't want to do something. You don't feel like it. I'm tired. Remember, it's not what you say. It's how you say it. And we're going to go through that in a minute. To extend that, that you are free to say no, you are free to say yes to something your spouse wants, right? You have a choice to say yes and you have a choice to say no. This is why sometimes in marriage it is good growth practice to say, I can't wholeheartedly say yes to this, so I'll have to say no this time. I can't say yes to this right now, but next time we can talk about it and then maybe, hey, we can say yes. It could be on whatever it is, many occasions, amen? Maybe it's with your brother, maybe, you know, it's with a family member, maybe it's with your kids, maybe it's with your spouse, amen? God works in many ways, but it says, no, I could say no. Yeah. Not this time, but next time, amen? I gotta say, sis, sister, I can't help you this time. I'm always there for you, but this time, I love you wholeheartedly, but I can't do it this time. Yeah. Next time I'll be available. And that's how it is, we could say no. It's okay to say no in our marriage. Okay, that's a boundary. It's not saying, I don't love you, I don't wanna do what you wanna do. It's a boundary. The law of evaluation, amen? I always tell my wife, go with me. When I gotta do an oil change or something, go with me, let's go. Let's go, go with me, no, no, no. You know, but hey, lately she's been going with me. That's cool, I'm fixing cars. She's She's in the house, boom, and then we're, we're still there, and we leave together. Amen? So there is a boundary there. The law number six is the law of evaluation. The law of evaluation. This is another story, okay? The writer writes, he says, Trent was at his wit's end. His wife, Megan, had once again run the credit card over the limit. Whenever she had a problem or fell down, shopping seemed to lift up her spirits. Man, shopping, huh? Shopping, hey, I feel bad. I wanna go shopping. I'm gonna go shopping, hey. You know, he left, I'm gonna go shopping, hey. Left the wallet right there, don't need to leave. That's what I say, you don't need to leave. <laughs> wow, Megan didn't see her spending as a problem, okay? It could be some else, but spending is a problem. We'll pay it off someday. She, re she, re she realized and ration rationalized. It's just a loan, Trent. However, feared that their financial state, yet always try to work harder to provide money, always trying to work harder to make more money, hoping this would solve the problem, amen? Sometimes making more money doesn't solve the problem, amen? It's the way we spend the money. It's the way we handle the money. Amen. We can make a lot of money just by not going out to eat. Believe me, it could rack up. Boom, boom, boom. 500 a month extra if we didn't go out to eat all month. Maybe a thousand for some of us. I'm serious. When I asked Trent, the writer says if he had considered canceling the credit card, he reacted quickly. I couldn't do that. No, not my wife. I can't cancel that credit card. He said, You don't know her. That how hard her life is. Everybody needs an outlet. And you should see her face when she comes. She's just beaming after she shops. She's happy, you know? Hey, money calls, what they say, money's happiness, but that's, that's not the way to go, amen? That's the world. What would she feel if the card was canceled? The writer asked him. Tears welled up in Trent's eyes. Uh, uh, she, she, she would be really hurt, he said. She never had anything as a little girl. Grew up dirt poor. Taking away the little she has now would devastate her. I just can't do that to someone I love. I can't do that. I can't take my wife's credit card for her. She grew up poor. Trent struggled in his evaluation of Megan's pain. He knew how impoverished her life was. Amen. So he used that as an excuse. I can't do that. I can't take that. So check this out. Trent confused two very different ideas. Okay? Pain and injury. Pain and injury. She confused the pain and injury, okay? Megan felt no pain when she shopped extravagantly, yet mar the marriage was being injured by her impulsive and trans-passivity. 
She wasn't feeling hurt, but a great deal of harm was being done. Amen. So there's a difference between pain and injury. Without her credit card cushion, Megan had to deal with these issues and credit card seclusion. And she began maturing. Amen. She was in pain, but she was not being injured. In fact, she was healing. Right? She was healing from not having nothing. So she felt that she had to have something in order to feel that because she never had anything. So that feeling, amen, and with the pain, with the pain, pain is helpful in our lives, amen. How many of us sometimes think that we're going through some pain? Amen, pain is growth, right? What do people say? No pain, no gain? Is that what people say? No pain? Let me ask you a question. You know, pastor talks about lifting up weights. We know about lifting up weights. When do you, when do you get the most growth? When you're going up or when you're going down? Anybody know? It's when you're going down because you're holding the weight, right? So you're holding the weight down and as you go down, that's when the pain starts occurring. That's when the muscles start breaking down because you're going down and you're holding the pain, right? So sometimes in our lives, God causes us to what? Causes pain in our lives, amen? And it's not from others, amen? It's not from the enemy, but we gotta see this in the spiritual sense that God, amen, not to hurt us, but he says that he will break us. He will break us and shatter us into pieces and what? Guess what? His word says that he will put us back together. Amen. He will put us back together. But sometimes in our lives there's pain. And pain causes growth. She was healing. It brings healing to us. There's certain pain that brings healing to us. So there's a difference between pain and injury. Just because someone is in pain doesn't necessarily mean something bad is happening. Let me, re, uh, let me re-say that again. Just because someone is in pain doesn't necessarily mean something bad is happening. Something good might be going on, such as we're learning to grow up in the pain. Amen. Without conflict, you can't grow. Amen. Without conflict, you can't grow. There has to be conflict, some conflict in the relationship. You can't just go stagnant and act like nothing's happening. Just like a Christian, he can't go all his life just like that, living his same life without nothing changing in his life, without nothing happening, without him to say no to something. There has to be conflict, amen? And with conflict, there's good conflict. Take it as soil, conflict. That soil, it could either be soil or dirt, right? What is soil? Soil is used to what? Fertilize, right? To fertilize, to nourish whatever uh, you guys planted there. And dirt, guess what? Dirt, everything dead drops on dirt. So conflict, there's something always out of conflict. Either there's death or life. But the soil, we want the conflict that comes with soil. And if we don't see it that way, we're always going to see conflict as, as death. We're always going to see conflict as dirt. What is dirt? All the dead stuff ha falls on the dirt. But when you put soil, it nourishes it. We need to evaluate the pain our boundaries cause others. Amen? What boundaries do you have? I know my wife said a boundary one time. She said, hey, can you, uh, can you, uh, it was about my socks, okay? It was about my socks. She just asked me, hey, when you take off your socks, can you make sure they're inside out, right? Put them the right way, because when I take them off, usually if they're uh, inside out, make sure they're the outside in, right? Right side in, there you go, sis, right side in. And she told me that, and that's something that stuck with me, but that was a boundary, hey, this bothers me. When I go to wash clothes, your sock is all crumbled up, and I gotta go in there, and it smells because it's been there for a week, and it's all smelly, and it came from your boot, and you were wearing it all day. And she says, can you please just, you know, do it the right way so I don't have to mess with it. Hey, throw it in the trash. <laughs> hey, she works at Walmart, so she buys new socks. Fine, let's get him on discount. She just throws them away. Hey, now I know Jeff gets clothes, new clothes every week. That's why I see him with new clothes. Throws his, tra his clothes away and buys some new clothes, huh? She buys some clothes. Buys some new clothes. Hey, wow. Hey, man, see? Jeff is blessed, Teresa. You got to see the good side, man. I'm a good wife. You see that? You gotta see it the no, other it way. Hey man, it could be as something as socks, hey amen. But we use boundaries, hey amen. That's something I stuck with it. Hey, I told her, hey, you know, we pick up your clothes, I pick up my clothes. 
Sometimes I slack on it, but guess what? I, I try to remember to pick up my clothes and throw it in the, in the hamper. You know, pick up in the hamper, amen? Man, Jeff, I'm, Jeff is blessed. New clothes, huh, every week. <laughs> oh, it's altar call, Teresa. We're going to go straight to altar call. <laughs> uh, amen, we're going to get through this. Amen, we're going to get through this. <laughs> Do they cause pain that leads to injury? Amen. Do your boundaries cause pain that leads to injury? Or do they cause pain that leads to growth? Amen. Injury or growth? There's two different ones, okay? And there's healthy to set healthy boundaries. Amen. There is. Sometimes we keep it all inside. And guess what? Just like this next one, we blow up. We blow up at the last minute. We hold it in and it just stays in and it builds up and it builds up. And at the last minute, we blow up. And you're like, wow, where did that come from, babe? Or where did that come from? It's like, man, I've been trying to tell you forever, but it just came out now. Certain situation. Amen. But remember, it is unloving to, it is unloving to set limits, limits with a spouse to harm him. Amen. We never want to harm your spouse. If anything, we're the Christians. We always want the best for others, the Bible says. No matter what, we want the best for others. As Christians, we want to see the best in others all the time. Amen. Somebody can do the right thing nine times. Somebody can do the right thing nine times. And that tenth time, he did it wrong. That's all they see. You did this wrong. You did this wrong. Uh, what about the other nine times? How come I don't get credit for that? It's just... That's the only thing that remembers that one time you Amen. That only thing. Oh, man, you messed up. And what about those nine times I did right? Man, you remember? I remember. But what about those nine times? You know, that's how we are. We're, we're human beings, man. We're Without God, man, we're, we're evil. I'm telling you, without God, we can, be, we can hurt people. Without God, we can, be hate. we can have hate in our hearts. We want to harm people. God's teaching me, amen. In the world I was growing up, what was the what was the golden rule? Treat others the way you want to be treated. And man, the Lord's helping me. He's like, in my mind, I'm like, treat others the way they treat you. And I'm like, no, that's wrong. That's wrong. And the Lord's helping me. Man, that is so wrong at work. I do it all the time. Treat other people the way they treat me. And I'm like, wow, that's so that is so wrong. And the Lord is teaching me. You don't treat others the way they treat you. You treat others. Amen. You treat others like Christ would. You treat others like Christ would. That's when you put Christ on. <laughs> Amen. Number seven. All right. We're going to get through this. Number seven. If you guys get tired, stretch, stand up. Amen. Do some jumping jacks. We're going to get through this. Amen. All right. The law of proactivity. Proactivity. All right. We're going to read another story, quick story. Okay. Eric and Judy had been married for 11 years and they felt their marriage was solid. Solid. Felt like their marriage was solid, like Pastor Solid. Huh? <laughs> Said, However, Eric, on the other hand, was sarcastic with Judy when they disagreed, being sarcastic. How many men in here are sarcastic? Nope, nobody? Nobody's sarcastic? Wow, oh, sarcastic, he said. Oh. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. The ladies. How many ladies then are sarcastic, huh? <laughs> sarcastic. They're always sarcastic when they, they disagree. He would lash out in Simon hilarious ways. You know, he was hilarious ways to win his point or to show her his anger with her. <laughs> Judy, on the other hand, was quiet and compliant all the time. When Eric was sarcastic and hurtful, she would take it silently, attempting not to sink down to her husband's level. But the feelings didn't go away, and they built up for years. Remember, they were married for 11 years. One night they argued, and Eric needled Ju Judy as usual. Out of the blue, she exploded in anger. She said, stop it, stop it, stop it. I'm sick and tired of your immature hatefulness, and I'm not going to put up with it anymore. So she put her foot down. She yelled for a while and then stopped. She yelled for a while, so she probably said other things, amen, that I can't say. It keeps going and going, use your imagination, and then she stopped. They were both in shock. She was in shock and he was in shock. As neither Eric nor Judy had seen this part of her before. They've never seen that part of her before. 
Judy felt horrible as she were a bad person. Judy had been keeping away from some truth she needed to express. Amen? How many of us sometimes hold some truths that we need to express to our spouse? We need to express to others. And we hold it in. That's why this boundary book is very, very, very helpful. And God is showing us something. Amen? Through these boundaries. Let me say this again. Judy had been keeping away from some truth she needed to express. Right? She needed to express it. Protest against Eric's hurtfulness. These truths finally bubbled over an intense reaction. Like a volcano. Boom! It came out. Judy's boundaries were reactive boundaries. Had, Julie, had Judy been less compliant long ago, she would have sat down with her husband and said, Honey, you have a mean side. And it makes me distant. It makes me distance myself from you. I love you, but I won't subject myself to this treatment. I want you to work on this issue with me so that it doesn't happen again. This approach is proactive rather than reactive. Amen? Proactive in our marriage, amen. To be able to set aside our spouse, amen. And we've been learning how to talk to our spouse. Talk to your spouse. Hey, this is this is what's going on. This bothers me. Or hey, I need to know this something, but we need to talk to our spouse. We need to talk to our, our kids. We need to talk to communicate. Amen. Be proactive in communication in our relationships. Instead of blowing up in the last minute. This approach is proactive rather than reactive. Telling them how it is up front. The law of proactivity is taking action to solve problems based on values, wants, and needs. Proactive people solve problems without having to blow up. Woo. I'm going to read that again. Proactive people solve problems without having to blow up. They are their boundaries, so they don't have to do a boundary as often as reactive folks do. Amen. We don't blow up on certain situations. We're able to talk about them, proactive, be able to talk to our spouse, be able to talk to our sons, be able to talk to our daughters. Amen, I gotta be more proactive, amen, with my daughter. More proactive instead of treating her the way she treats me. And the Lord's been teaching me that. The way she treats me, I hit her back. I hit her back with that same attitude. She gives me attitude, I hit her back with that same attitude, back. And back and I keep flashing and, and fighting and fighting and it's like the Lord's like don't be don't be reactive be proactive sit down you're her stepdad you have some kind of authority and in some way you have lost that authority as a parent and that way that's why she talks to you that way and the Lord's bringing me back to proactive sit down and talk to her amen like she's an adult tell her you know you know what, hey, I'm in this situation because I love your mother. Hey, you know what, I don't like the way you're talking to me. And talk to her like she's never seen her before. Let her know, proactive. Let her know you're serious. And that's what the Lord's showing me, amen. Number seven, the law of proactivity. Let's be proactive, amen, in our relationships. Our boundaries, we have to be proactive. You can't be just reactive, just blow up whenever. Amen, and the Lord's showing me that. Showing me that at work, and he's showing me that he's showing me at home how to be proactive instead of reactive all, all the time, just treating people the way they treat me, bah, bah, fighting, screaming, hey, let's go. Even with the sarcastic, I'm very sarcastic with my, uh, very sarcastic with my, uh, with my boss, amen, with my supervisor and the bosses in the office. I'm very sarcastic because they're in the world all the time, right? And the only way I think I can get back at them is being, being sarcastic, right? And it hurts, it, it works, but it hurts, but it's causing injury. Do you guys see that? It's causing injury. It's probably not causing injury to them because they're not saved, but it's causing injury to my spirit because of being, because of being sarcastic to them. Number eight, the law of envy. The law of envy, amen? The most powerful obstacle to setting boundaries in our marriage is envy. The law of envy states that we will never get what we want if we focus outside of our boundaries on what others have. Envy is devaluating what we have, thinking it's not enough. It's not enough. I need more. I need more. I need more. It's not enough where I'm working at. I need another job. I need more money. I need another house. I need another car. I need another chain. I need this. I lost my chain, so I need another chain. You know? 
Another credit card, amen. Another credit card. Be maxed out, amen, within the month. So envy, we think as, as couples, we become sometimes envy. Sometimes we think that God has favor on, on our spouse more than us. So it's all about envy, all right? We can't focus on what others have. All the while resenting them for having good things and we don't possess, amen? Psalms 37, 4, our desires. God will give us our what? Our desires of our heart, right? Our desires of our heart. Check this out. Envy is miserable because, because we're dis, dissatisfied with our state, yet powerless to change it. That's why we, we become envy because we're powerless to change our situation. So envy kicks in. This is why it is such a powerful obstacle. The envious person doesn't set limits because he is not looking at himself long enough to figure out what choices he has. Instead, he is envious eyes keeping him focused upon other people. And man, God's word says that, delight yourself also in the Lord and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Let me tell you this tonight. Don't confuse envy with desire, okay? And if you can teach somebody, teach somebody. Do not confuse envy with desire. Oh, okay, I don't even need it no more. <laughs> Sorry, Pastor. I think I'm talking loud enough. I got myself pumped up. I don't understand partial sign language. I don't know what this is. <laughs> your daughter's hello, hello. Amen. So don't confuse, amen, envy with desire. Desire involves wanting something, and it motivates us to take action to possess it. Desire involves wanting something, and it motivates us to take action to possess it. God wants to give us our desires of our hearts, right? Even coming to church, our desires of our hearts, our desires. What are desires? Our desires is what? To get filled by God, right? To get filled in the spirit, to walk in goodness, to walk in meekness, to walk in humility, to walk in kindness, to walk in faithfulness, to walk in long suffering. That's the desires of our, of our heart, of our spirit. Desire doesn't focus on our emptiness. Amen. Let me repeat that. Desire doesn't focus on our emptiness, nor how lucky others seem to be. Desire preserves the goodness and value of what we have and of those we are in a relationship with. Amen. Preserves. Desire preserves. Envy. What does envy do? Envy wants to come in and trade in right away. In and out. Come and go. Come and go. That's what envy does. Come and go. In and out. Boom. I don't need it no more. Come and out. In with the next one. And desire preserves, preserves the relationships, preserves love, preserves goodness, it preserves faithfulness in others and builds up that relationship, right? Pain causes growth. Is it causing growth or is it causing injury? There's a boundary. If it's causing injury, there's a boundary. You have to say no. So in marriage, envy can lie at the heart of many boundary problems, amen? In marriage, envy can lie. Envy can take us to lie in our marriage. Because what does envy do? Envy takes. It takes. Desire preserves, envy takes. It takes the joy of our spouse. It takes the, the peace of our spouse. We're more mad. How many of us, when we're mad in our, in our spouses, is, is in peace, right? You kind of want to go over there and interrupt their peace. Like, hey, you know, I'm not happy. You're not going to be happy. I'm not joyful. You're not going to be joyful. Amen? But that's envy. That's a heart problem. That's not desire. Desire is the opposite. Man, I'm angry right now. I don't want to go because I'm going to explode in front of my family. I want to get away. I want to go in the presence of God. I mean, I want to get rid of this envy. I want, I want the desire Desire to preserve, desire the goodness, to have peace, to calm down before I go into the house. Why are you stay in the car so long, brother? I don't got a radio. I don't got a radio. Hey man, expose it, Lord. That's why we're up here. Expose it. Expose anything, hey amen, in the darkness. Wow, amen. God is so good, amen. We're going to go to law number nine. I said we're going to ride this train home. 
We're going to get through this. Go to the next chapter. The law of activity. The law of activity states that we need to take the initiative to solve our problems rather than being passive. Have you ever noticed how some couples are divided into active spouse and the passive one? Amen. One's active and one's passive. One spouse takes more initiative, sets goals, confronts problems. The other waits for his spouse to make move first and then responds. Amen. So are you, are you proactive? Are you, pass, are you active or are you passive? It's just a question. You've got to raise your hand. Are you active or are you passive? Do you wait your spouse to take charge, to make responsibilities, to make certain choices? Or do you make choices on your own? Knowing, knowing that they're aligned with your husband. Say your husband's not here, you gotta make a choice. Are you gonna make that choice? Or are you gonna wait till he gets back a week later and be like, well, how come you didn't make this choice? I'm like, I was waiting for you. I'm like, you should have made that choice. You already know what I would have done, right? So are we being active or are we being passive? We gotta be active, amen? The law of activity, it's called. Number nine, the law of activity. All things being equal, active spouses have an edge in boundary setting. Taking an initiative increases one's chances to learn from mistakes. We learn from mistakes. We got to be active. Both spouses have to be active. You can't just have one laying around and just making all the decisions and the other one's just coasting through. You guys are both in it. Decisions for the kids. Decisions for family members. Decisions. Amen. On the bills, decisions on rather to get a new car or not. Decisions on getting a house. Decisions, decisions. Decisions. Passive people have trouble learning because they are afraid to take risk. Passive people have trouble learning because they're afraid to take risk. They're afraid to take risk. Amen. And can I, I just wanted to show an example of like just passive or active. It's just an example that stood in my mind that even uh, when we were having the carnitas, remember? We were having the carnitas sale and everything, and that little thing kept going off. That little, the little breaker kept going off, and, and everybody's asking, Pastora, what do we do? What do we do? Pastora's like back and forth, and everybody's like, what do we do? And she's like, well, use the other breaker, and then use this, and use that. And you know what I mean? That's just an example of active or passive. Like, we have to find a solution sometimes ourselves. If we don't have nobody there, you have to be passive, amen? But it has to be, what, a godly choice? It has to come with wisdom, understanding, it has to come with knowledge of what your husband would do. That's why we gotta know each other. Because if I'm not there, my wife has to make a decision and it's a hard one, she has to make one that's the closest one to what, what I, I would pick, amen? If pastor's not here, Amen. I would have to make a choice to where it would uh, line up to what he would do. It would line up to God's word. Amen. It would line up. Brother Ricky said, take, hey, take care of the men's uh, fellowship. I had to be passive and be like, all right, it has to be lined up to what he said. I have to be passive. Right? I mean, I have to be active, not passive, active. Forgive me. See, I messed up. I learned. Sometimes we say the wrong things, but we have to correct ourselves. He wants his people, God, Hebrews 10, 38, amen, not to shrink back. Even as Christians, we have to make certain decisions, amen, certain decisions. He wants his people to participate in life with him, not to wait on the sidelines. Now the dust shall live by faith, but if, if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him, he said. We're not of those that shrink back. We don't give up. We keep going forward, amen. Keep going forward. When one spouse is active and the other one passive, several problems can occur. The active spouse may dominate the passive one. And there's always a dominant. The active spouse may feel abandoned by the passive one. The passive spouse may become too dependent on the active one's initiatives. The passive spouse may resent the power of the active one. The passive spouse may be too intimidated by the active one to say no. Intimidation. When both spouses are active in boundary settings, when they both speak the truth, when they both solve problems, when they both set goals, they will both grow. Amen. They will both grow. And that's what we're here for. We're here to grow in relationships. It's a marriage seminar, but, you know, 
You can use it as a relationship with your kids, with your spouses, with your boss at work, with a friend, with a coworker, always to grow. We're the Christians. We're the ones to grow all the time. We haven't reached the goal. We, I'm not there yet. I'm not that far in my walk, he said. Remember that preacher said, I'm not that far in my walk. You tell me when you're perfect. But we're always to grow. And man, we're always to learn something. We're always to humble ourselves and to be able to grow every day as Christians. That's what we do. Walk in humility, be able to grow. Always seeing the best in others. Law number 10. And man, we're taking us home. Home run. Home run, the law of exposure. The law of exposure. Don't wait for your spouse to take the first step. Assume the first move is always yours, this book says, when he's not there. Amen. But what, what, is the, what does the Bible say that, what, the man is to lead, right? And the man is to lead. In certain situations, let me tell you, there's going to be a time where the man is going to make a choice where his woman is not there, his wife is not there, and he's going to make a choice, right? And the, and, and the woman has to, has to sometimes deal with that choice, right? Because he's a man of the household. But remember, remember, pain or injury when it comes to that decision, our, all, all our actions have consequences. This is what it's teaching us. The law of exposure states that we need to communicate our boundaries to each other. When's the last time you communicated a boundary to your lover? Not, um, that, yeah, your lover, your wife. When's the last time you communicated a boundary? We have to communicate. Hey, this bothers me. Hey, I can't be doing this. Hey, how can I help you if you don't tell me how to help you? Because I'm, I'm a man. I, I think different. I'm solving problems. Sometimes I got to ask. Like today I learned it was the biggest I, I humbled myself. The Lord humbled me so much today. I had to ask my wife, how do I help you? How can I help you? Because I don't know how to help you. My way of helping you is the wrong way. So I set a boundary. I was like, I can't help you the way I want to help you because it's not the right way. So I had to ask her, how can I help you? I needed to hear it from her mouth. Is there a way that I can help you without me trying to put myself in it? Like, what do I need to do? What would you like me to do for you? That's gonna make you feel better. That's gonna make you feel like I'm helping you and not just pushing you. So set, we have to set a time to communicate our boundaries to each other, okay? God designed boundaries to promote love and truth. Spouses need to make clear what they do or don't want. It's like, my, uh, it's like Brother Dave. Brother Dave said one time, well, if my wife cooks me dinner and I tell her it's good all the time and I don't like it, she's always going to cook it for me. Right? She's always going to cook it for me. So it's like you got to tell her it's going to hurt her feelings, but, man, you, if you don't tell her, hey, she's always going to make it for you. It says they need to work on understanding what their spouse is saying about their boundaries, okay? So we're going to work on boundaries. When boundaries are exposed... Two souls can be connected in marriage. And you don't always have to fight and figure out, man, how come he keeps doing this? How come he always keeps doing this and, and he don't listen? How come they don't listen when we tell them something? They keep doing it over and over and over and over and over. They keep doing it. I tell them to pick it up. I tell them to put this here. I tell them to take this out. I tell them to put it back. But if there's no boundaries, we're not going to change in our marriage. Our marriage is never going to grow if we don't set boundaries. You know, there's certain rules. If you grab it, put it back. If you turned it on, turn it off. If you open it, close it. <coughs> right? Certain rules that we should know. But when boundaries are unexposed, check this out. When boundaries are unexposed, spouses are less emotional uh, or less emotionally present in marriage. They shut off. Marriages are so shut off right now because of what the world is teaching. They're not teaching about what God is saying. And man, what is God saying? You guys are one. You guys are married. You guys are one. Divorce doesn't exist. You guys got to work it out. Go to your pastors. I mean, go to the church. Divorce should be ultimately, shouldn't be on the table, but it, it should definitely be on the bottom of the list. Way at the bottom. It shouldn't even be on there, but some people, that's what they, they end up doing is divorcing. But we don't believe in divorce. Right? We don't believe in divorce. Amen? 
but it should be at the bottom. Amen. So we got to be together. We have to be in the relationship together, whether it's with your son, whether it's with your daughter, whether it's with your spouse or your coworker. But we have to be in the relationship. There has to be boundaries. Amen. There has to be boundaries. All right. When we expose our boundaries to the light of the relationship, all right, what's in the darkness must come out to the light. What's in the back of the closet has to come to the front of the closet. When we expose our boundaries to the light of relationship, we can be fully connected to our spouses. Is that what we really want to do, right? I really want to be connected to my wife. I really want to be the one that talks to her forever, for an hour and a half, like she talks to her, like she would talk to her friend. I want to be the one talking to her like I would talk to my friend at work. I, I, I want to be the one to where we're connected. I understand her. I understand what she's going through. I, and that's where God's taking me. I think he's taking me to that point. And I know he's taking me to that breaking point to where I'm starting to understand my wife. That we are different. That she thinks different from I am. If I say it this way, she's going to do it a different way. Okay? It's okay when people do things a different way. It doesn't always have to be your way. It doesn't have to be our way. It's okay when people do it different. It's like stack these blocks, right? And your son stacks them a certain way. And you're like, no, nah, do it over. Because you want him to do stack it a, a certain way. But it's like, no, he's stacking it different. Because that's how his mind is comprehending right now. This is the way he stacks it. And we have to understand. We have to understand that we're different. And we have to be okay with the way they stack the blocks. With the way different uh, other people work. We can resolve problems and we can take a stand to actively love our spouses by risking conflict for the sake of our relationship. If there's conflict, we can't run from it. Amen. I learned. God showed me you can't run from conflict. You have to run to conflict. Amen. What do the buffaloes do? The buffaloes, they're different from the cows. The cows run away from the storm. You know what the buffaloes do? The buffaloes run into the storm. They run into the storm. Because they say, I'm going to get through this faster if I run through the storm. I'm going to get to the other side. Because the cow, he's always running from the storm. And the storm's always chasing him. So guess what? We face the conflict. Amen. No running. I ain't going to run from my dad. Amen. I ain't going to run. Run to him. Yeah, I'm going to run to him. Amen. <laughs> Panzazo. I'll run to him. Boom. <laughs> Amen. So remember that we can resolve problems and we can take a stand to actively love our spouse by risking conflict for the sake of the relationship. Exposure is the only way for healing and growth to take place. I'm going to repeat that. Exposure is the only way for healing and growth to take place. Apply these laws to your marriages and see how they change the way you relate to each other. Remember, you can't break laws forever without consequences. There's going to be consequences. We all have either to live in accord with them or, and succeed or continually defy them and pay consequences. Amen. Pay consequences. I don't want to pay the consequences of not understanding my wife. I don't want to pay the consequences, amen, of me and my dad always arguing. I don't want to pay the consequences, amen, of, of, of having to walk away from something when I can walk to it instead of walking away. Amen. So with this boundary book, it's been it's been really good if you if you apply the boundaries and God's been taking me through it, setting boundaries, setting, you know, asking questions, asking my wife questions more recently. You know, we've been married for like I said seven years, and I already think I know her. I know everything, but I don't. There's always more to know to your wife by asking questions. Amen. And we can ask God questions. Amen. When's the last time you uh, you uh, asked God a question? Amen. Don't forget, you have to ask God questions. He wants you to come to Him. He's our Father. He wants you to come to Him. Come and ask me, how do I handle this situation? I got to ask Him a question. Lord God, how do I handle this situation, Lord God, when I don't have the answer? God's waiting for us. 
And man, that's why this altar is here. We have questions that we got to ask him. Why am I not that motivated? Why am I not this? Or why is this happening? Why don't I have the solution? Or, and he will answer you. But the Bible says we have not because we ask not. We have not because we ask not. Maybe you haven't asked God deeply, sincerely, Lord God, why, why this or why that or how long or when or how long will I wait? God has three answers, right? Yes, no, and wait. Yes, no, and wait. And the Lord's waiting for us. He's waiting for us to come ask him questions. We have to treat him like he's our dad. He's our father. He's waiting for us. Lord God, I need help. Lord God, I, why this? Lord God, he's waiting for us because he loves us. Just like our kids. He always, our kids always want to learn. My son always says, come over here, dad. Come over here, dad. Let's do this, dad. Let's do this. That's how God's waiting for us. Man, he's waiting for us at the dinner table. He's waiting for us when we go to bed. He's waiting for us in the morning. He's waiting for us when we take lunch. Our God always, he's always open for us to talk to him. I believe that it's us that don't go to him enough. It's us that don't go and seek God when we have to. Amen. Home run. Home run. God is good. Amen. God is good. I'm going to leave it to pastor. Amen. We're going to do an altar call because God wants us to ask him questions. God wants us to bother him. God wants us to love him. Man, give the Lord a great big praise this night. Amen. We're going to come up to this altar and pray, amen, here tonight. How many of you guys were blessed, amen, by that study? Amen. At least Ricky was, amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Help him, help him deal with Brenda. Amen. Hallelujah. Before we come up to this altar, amen, uh, I just want to do a brief recap real quick on uh, 2 Chronicles 20, verses 10 through 12. It says, But now here are the men of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, whose territory you would not allow Israel to invade when they came from Egypt. So they turned away from them and did not destroy them. Verse 11, See how they are repaying us by coming to drive us out of the possession you gave us as an inheritance. And then verse 12, our God, will you judge, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Like I shared on Sunday, you know what, there's times in our lives that, you know, we, we just don't know what to do. But at the beginning of, of Second Chronicles, amen, um, he made it very plain on what to do. You know, first he said to, to assemble, amen, to assemble the, the brethren most importantly, amen. I think that's, uh, that's something that a lot of people don't... Uh, don't do when when things are going on they gather around family members or they gather around you know what other individuals but they don't gather around a body of believers amen which is so important because we need to to gather around each other amen but he says here he says in verse 5 it says then Jehoshaphat stood up in the assembly of Judah at Jerusalem, at the temple of the Lord, in front of the new co uh, courtyard, and said, See, a lot of times when we come to God, we come to God and bring Him our requests. God, you know what? This is going on. You know what? God, this is how... God knows all things. And one thing about, one thing about Jehoshaphat is that he, know, he knew the power, amen? He knew the key, amen, in recognizing God. So he called the assembly together, amen. The, the assembly came together, but the first thing that he wanted the assembly to know, it's not about our problem. You know what, it's not about our health. You know what, it's not about a healing. You know what, it's not about any of that. And what he did is he said, he said, Lord, the God of our ancestors, are you not the God who is in heaven? Why the God of our ancestors speaks volumes. 
Why? Because if you begin to go back, amen, you get to see parting the Red Sea, amen. You get to see him delivering them from Egypt. You know what I mean? Just everything as you go back. Abraham, amen, before he was Abraham, amen. Sarah, before she was Sarah, amen. We see all these things, how God came through. And that's what Jehoshaphat did, you know what I mean? He was bringing to remembrance. Man, you're God. You know what? And you're able to do all things. You know what? You're the God of the heavens. You know what? You're the God of all mankind, Lord. You are, you're mighty. You know what? You're in all your splendor. You're holy, Lord God. And you're more than able, Lord God, than any problem or any situation that I have in life. And see, and that's what we got to do when we come to God. See, we got, God wants to answer our prayer. You know what? The Bible says, like, like Brother Misa said, he wants to give us the desires of our heart. You know what, God is more than willing to, to give us, you know what, more than we could ever imagine or even believe. But the thing is, is you know what, He wants us, you know what, to, to, to recognize Him. You know, I think a lot of times Christians don't, don't recognize, you know what, who God is. You know what, they don't remember, you know what, what God did for them. And that's why so many Christians, you know what, they complain. So many Christians, they grumble. So many Christians are unhappy. So many Christians, you know what? They want what somebody else has. You know what? So many Christians, you know what? They, they, just, they just don't know. They don't know the goodness of God. The goodness of God. Man, the goodness of God goes, us, goes with us everywhere, church. And I like with the, the, with the boundaries and that lesson tonight, you know what, on those, on those 10 things, you know what, it, it's okay to say no sometimes, you know what, it, it's okay to say yes, you know what, and it's okay to say wait. Eee, it's okay to say wait. But how we said in the healing, in that healing, you know what, not, not, not saying nothing, you know what, but having a boundary. You know what, being able to, to sit there and listen and, and hear what, what, what's being brought forth. I was talking to my wife and I was talking to, to another friend of mine, but the Christians are so, you know what, soft skin these days. Man, anything, you know what, it's like, man, you, you can't say anything. You can't even burp or something, you know what, and somebody gets offended or somebody gets mad, you know what, that hurt my feelings or this or that. You, Man, we need to get some thick skin, church. Thick skin. Man, remember when we were younger, you know, when somebody would be able to call you a name, and yes, it would hurt, but you know what? You would still be able to move on with life. You know what? You would be able to forget about it and just keep on going. You know what? That ain't nothing. You know what? Nowadays, people are so, you know what, thin skinned that, man, you can't even, you can't even look at them. Cole. Man, you can't even look at them and right away they, they get all hurt or offended or something. You know what? You were looking at me with eyes of anger. You're like, no, I was tired. <laughs> amen. You know what? But we're going to come up here and we're going to pray tonight. Amen. It's such a blessing to be able to go through lessons. Amen. And studies as well as, you know what? Have a preaching of the word and, and a gathering. Amen. Of the body of believers. Amen. I don't know about you, but you see them. I see them, amen, they're, they're all around, amen, they're, they're here, amen. The thing is, is we got to realize is that, you know what, there's angels all around us, church. There's angels all around us, amen, and you never know when you might be entertaining an angel, amen. What if there's angels there? There is, amen, but angels in here right now, amen, and they just were enjoyed by, by hearing that word, amen. amen. And now they're going to get excited, amen, because we're going to come up here, amen, and we're going to break before God, amen. God bless you guys here tonight, amen. Let's, let's come, you know what, give God our hearts, amen. God bless you.